Welcome back, everybody, to the Lord's Foundation Faith and Family Series. Uh, we're back for the second week with our dear friend and Vice President of Mission at Lord's, Rob Tasman. And um, last week we uh, had a, a great opportunity to dive into this topic that Rob has uh, graced us with for this Lenten season, Radical Kinship. And we ended uh, last week on the topic of stagnation and growing complacent. And uh, I loved Rob's point on, um, you know, not overanalyzing, sometimes having the, the tendency to over discern or overanalyze and kind of getting stuck and the importance of action uh, when trying to move a mission forward or just trying to grow and advance. Um, we're going to dive back into this radical kinship topic. Uh, I'm Lance Strother and uh, I'm with Lead Professionals Group. Happy and blessed to, to be with Rob for week two. And we're going to dive right in. Rob, if you'd like to open us up in prayer. Sure, absolutely. Let's take a minute to just orient ourselves. I know we're here in the evening. Let's leave everything behind that preceded us here today so we can enter into this space in an intentional manner. So will begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to call us here together tonight. Bless the meeting that Lance and I have with one another. Bless all those who are viewing, especially their families during this time of Lent. May they be ever mindful of the constant presence that you are within their lives and may they manifest that in ways that they live out their lives, that they get to know their neighbors, that they respect them with a true sense of dignity, knowing that you are within all of us because you have created us. For all this we pray through your Holy Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Absolutely. Good to be back with you. Great to be back. Man, we're going to just dive right in uh, this radical kinship uh, theme that uh, it's kind of a coin term that, that you gave us and that you've been kind of speaking about. And as we discussed last week, it's something that's kind of being interwoven into your work at Lourdes. Um, right. Maybe just... Let's return back to it, um, especially for our audience who maybe wasn't able to join us last week. Sure. Tell us one more time, what is radical kinship? Yeah, so, you know, radical kinship is my <laughs> humble way of suggesting that we try to overcome the divisions and the polarization that exists in our world today. Kinship ex itself is a shared set of characteristics and origins. And what makes it radical is connecting it to our gospel, knowing that we have to act on those things. It has to be living. It is the living word of God. I love that. And um, we kind of touched uh, last week on some of that radical part being uh, stretching your comfort zone a little bit. Right. And sometimes uh, maybe taking a step back, particularly in the Lenten season, and considering maybe some of our defaults, how when we see other people, right. sometimes the very first thing that we see are our divisions or our differences. Uh, this radical kinship theme being, maybe we see the, the utmost dignity in that person before we see those differences. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, you know, you think about it, Lance, and from our faith tradition, from a Christian tradition, separation is a fallacy. It, we are not separate from one another. Division is, something that is truly not of God. We are called to be together. That is, that is who we are. You know, we read in the, in the gospel that we are our brothers and sisters keepers, but we're our brothers and sisters keepers because we are brothers and sisters. That is who we are. And I think the more that we come to realize that and recognize that, then that will help us overcome some of these great gaps and these chasms, if you will, that exist within our society. It's the only way that I can see that we can we can attempt at least to move that path forward. I like the way that you put that. And um, spiritually speaking, uh, I almost hear that as a an invitation for me personally to consider <clears throat> the gap or the chasm between my heart and the Lord and His His will for me and yeah. what He's calling me to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know, and and look, I'm going to be very honest and and frank myself personally here. This is something that I struggled with for a while. People said, well, you know, you've committed your life to an expression of your faith professionally. You must be great at prayers. I said, no, there was a long time I was really bad at it, quite frankly. And the reason that I was bad at it is because I had this great divide between my head and my heart. So yes, I studied it. I knew the information. I could spout theology. But getting it in your heart is really what matters at the end of the day. 
And so now being in healthcare, I looked it up, I found it fascinating. The average distance between your head and your heart is 18 inches. But that can be the longest 18 inches that you possibly have to try and overcome sometimes. So making sure that we get it out of our head, back into our hearts, that's what's going to draw us into being able to be compassion. That's what's going to be able to draw us into being able to, to move toward the action, to recognize every individual as being created in the image and likeness of God, and then knowing what exactly that means for us as we go about it within our communities. Uh. I believe that time spent, uh, be it organizationally, on a team, individually, in relationship with God, time spent giving attention to that gap between what we know right. and what we do yeah. uh, is time well spent. Yeah, very well. Very um, well spent. Let's, uh, I want to get back into this, uh, the kinship piece. and. Um, in, you, you gave a talk in Baton Rouge recently. It's uh, it's on YouTube. I, I checked it out. It's awesome. It's Thank it's you. worth watching. Um, but you talked about how we belong to each other. Yeah. Where does that come yeah. from? Tell me about that. Yeah. You know, Saint Mother Teresa had this great quote, and she said that she <clears throat> felt like I'm going to paraphrase, of course, but she felt like all the divisions and the separation that we face today in society is because we don't recognize that we belong to each other, right? And so, you know, that, that compels me in, in the work that I have to make sure that we look at individuals as our own shared creation. Uh, one of the things I love to do with the boys sometimes is if they talk about differences amongst classmates or things like that, I said, well, you know, you can highlight those and look at it in a negative way and draw attention to that which separates us. Or you can step back and say, oh my gosh, look at how fascinatingly creative and imaginative our God is to have created all these different people in many ways, and yet we are all part of this universal family as a result. And so that's, that's something that I try to do in my family to try and get them there as, as they continue to mature so that they realize what their place is within a community. Some of these things too, Lance, I think, you know, we we try to really complicate things in our world sometimes. Um, I, I cannot express to you what I have learned, especially in the hospital ministry, about the power of presence. Just presence alone, right? Just being there, being with. A lot of times I think we think we've got a checklist, we have to do A, B, and C, we have to show that we've done something. And what that means is that when we're just in the room with somebody being present, we think we've done nothing. And it's quite the contrary. The power of presence itself is incredibly powerful. I love that point. It's a personal point. Uh, the power of presence. Um, the late Father Joe Bro uh, was a dear friend and spiritual director. And um, one of his greatest gifts, one of his legacies is, is that very thing. Mm -hmm. Just the power of presence. Uh, he wasn't necessarily the most charismatic uh, spiritual leader I've ever had, but he was very present, yeah. a willing listener. Yeah. Um, so common ground. Yeah. Uh, as vice president of mission, um, we talked about uh, this a little bit in the, in the first series, but just revisiting it a little bit, as, as you encounter people, both as in the hospital system, but also you as the missionary of, <laughs> of Lourdes, um, you know, what's been your experience finding that common ground? Yeah. Yeah. So I started a standpoint, Lance, where common ground to me makes me think of the image of a Venn diagram, right? You have all these circles and at some point they're usually shaded and the darkest shade is right there in the middle where they all overlap at that point of intersection. And I think we have that. We have that in our shared experiences of our own journeys, of our life experiences. A lot of times though, what we have to do to be able to get there is, first of all, we've got to let our own selves get out of our own way, right? And we've got to let things work, the spirit work, and let ourselves get there. And the other thing is, a lot of times we just have to listen. You know, we just have to listen and be open to the sense that there are things that we share. I might not know your story and you might not know mine, but if we have the chance to sit down and, and share it with one another, who knows what we have in common and what we can then use that for, for the betterment of our communities and for the betterment of our cause. Um, you know, I liken this too. I, I think silence is so important to our lives because we live in this world of incredible busyness and distractions all the time. 
And I want to make just a quick little connection between, say, silence and the sacrament of sacred presence, right? So you shared this powerful story about Father Bro. For me, I have two stories, uh, one that took place almost three years ago to the day of this taping. In 2019, I was involved in a really serious auto accident. I was traveling back from my work to home. I got hit from the rear end, pushed across the double yellow lines, got hit head on. I woke up on the passenger side door of the car. My head had busted out the passenger window. I'd lost about 75% of my right ear, have some sustained hearing loss, broke four ribs and had two spinal fractures. So I have four boys, as I've said many times already, right? So I come home from the hospital. They had not been in the hospital to visit me, which was probably wise. And they all had different reactions. The oldest has a little bit more of a timid personality, didn't really want to get too close to me at all. The second, he's very curious, wanted to get all up in my business. Let's see the gore, you know, and I was bruised and battered and still a little bit bloody. The fourth, who was the youngest at the time, five, he wanted to get close, but he did not want to get near the right side of my body, which is where the ear was. And the third, and I deliberately leave him for last, he was eight at the time. There was a point when I transitioned from the kitchen to the den, and he followed me into the den. I sat down on the couch. He sat down right next to me on the side, the worst side of my body, and held my hand for 45 minutes. He said nothing. He didn't move. And it was, to me, the sacrament of sacred presence. I felt empathy. I felt love. I felt compassion. I felt strength. I, I felt everything I needed to feel with just simply an embrace of a little boy's hand who is my own son. I'm sorry to get emotional talking about it, but it's still powerful to this day. Most recently in my ministry at Lourdes, we had a phenomenal example of the, of the power of sacred presence and silence. There was a young woman who had suffered from cancer. She had presented herself to the hospital. Her friends decided that they wanted to stay in vigil for the day. They really believed it was going to be her last day here on earth with us. One of them I knew, they called me and they said, hey, can we at least just get into the chapel? All we want to do is get into the chapel, stand vigil and pray. And that is exactly what they did in a very, very beautiful way. They, play, they prayed the, the chaplet of divine mercy, the rosary. They were there for the entirety of the day. And when I left to check on them, their dear friend had just passed away. But they were there. That, that's presence. Now, the friend, you know, they couldn't get into the room because of the restrictions we had due to COVID with regard to visitation. But I know their friend knew that they were there. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. That's, that's presence. Well, those are really powerful. We're glad to still have you with us. Yeah, thank uh, you. How long were you in the hospital after that accident? Well, uh, fortunately, I was only in for about three days. I think they wanted to get me out of there real quick. But wow. uh, yeah, it was it was an experience and, um, you know, very grateful to be here. Frankly, it connects me to what I do now at Lourdes because I was cared for greatly by the people at Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge, which is part of our entire health system, the Franciscan missionaries of Our Lady. And, uh, and there was a great sense of uh, comfort being in a Catholic hospital. When you have a need that needs to be met and, and you don't know exactly what you can do, if at the very least you can look around the walls and find the crucifix and you say to yourself, I'm going through some pain right now, but if I can unite that pain to the cross, which we're here in Lent, right? So, I mean, we can, we can imagine that more vividly than any other point of our year. Um, that speaks volumes itself to be in that kind of a facility. That's powerful. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, four boys, you know, yeah. I, I would imagine you could share some stories where they just about killed you, but yeah. that one right there is a, a, a really beautiful life giving one. Um, and speaks powerfully to that ministry of presence. Um, you mentioned in this, uh, context of, of kinship, connection, closeness, uh, we are each other's. Uh, you mentioned this, the, the importance of listening, yeah, which I think is yeah. so huge and so important. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it so hard to listen? I, 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 think, yeah. I think for our, our audience viewing, um, spiritually, it's hard to listen. Yeah. Sometimes just socially or as we move about our society uh, with our own, um, our own weaknesses, our, you know, all the things going on. It's a, it's a challenge to truly listen. But I think, yeah. to your point, without it, how much can we really put into action this radical kinship? Yeah. So why is yeah. listening 
so hard? Yeah, so I, I think because truly, again, based on what I said earlier, there are just so many distractions that we're constantly faced with, right? I mean, we have advances in technology, which are wonderful. I mean, we're utilizing this tonight as in a way to evangelize and catechize. But technology itself, too, can be incredibly distracting, right? The, the phone in front of you, the iPad, whatever it is. Do I have to answer the next email? If I don't respond immediately to a text message, does that have some kind of consequences associated with it? And so I think what we really need to try and do is just is quiet ourselves, right? Because, I mean, quiet reorients ourselves to what it is that's around us. And one of the things that I like to talk to you about people uh, as well, Lance, is that for me, everybody wants to be for something. You want to be for a cause. You want to be for someone in need. And I think we need to t take a step back, and I think we need to be with people, right? This is the connection of the sacrament of sacred presence and, and silence and getting over the distractions. When we're with someone, we get to listen to them, you know, especially if we humble ourselves to their presence and to what their story is. We get to listen to them. And because of that, we're going to know better what it is that they actually need and see if there's a way that we can assist. And then we become a sense of together workers, co-workers, you know, to be able to do this. Um, you know, I, I, I think of a story with regard to that and uh, even the story, the great gospel story of Jesus healing the blind man, right? He goes up to the blind man and he says, what is it that you need from me? And you say to yourself, is this Jesus or Captain Obvious? The guy's blind, right? But Jesus does not presuppose that even he knows what the blind man needs. We don't know what we don't know. And so when we listen, when we put ourselves in the presence of somebody else, and when we quiet ourselves, we get to a sense of acknowledging, let them tell us so that we can truly be together and assist in whatever it is that is, is truly their need. That's awesome. Uh, in our first episode, uh, one of the, the big topics that you, you shared with, with us on is intentionality. And um, I'm just thinking about the spiritual life uh, and just the, the development of us as individuals. I loved your point about uh, maybe it's not as much as who we're for or what we're for, but who we're with. Um, and then drawing in this intentionality theme with listening, uh, it, it, it makes me think of uh, the wisdom that draws us to being intentional about who do I sit with? Right. Who do, who do I listen to? Um, yep. Because it's, we do listen to a lot of things and uh, finding that quiet time today is harder than ever. Right. Uh, and, and I'm certainly not preaching here. I'm yeah. <laughs> being testimonial <laughs> no. myself. It's yeah. uh, golly, there's so much noise and distractions that I like. Right. Um, right. So has there been people in your life that you've been intentional about sitting with and listening to that has shaped yeah. you? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, um, I have tried my approach to any kind of leadership role that I've been in is just to always have an open door. Right. And, and a lot of times, frankly, that can be a little bit frustrating because mm -hmm. if you're really willing to do that, you get a lot of distractions yourself throughout the course of the day. But I think at the end of the day, people value being heard because if they're heard, that expresses the fact that you have recognized the inherent value that they have, right? And so I think listening is critically important. Certainly in my own home, I, I practice that as much as I possibly can with my wife. You know, I mean, she's the one who's really in the heart of it with the boys. She has more to tell me every single day than I might care to hear some days. <laughs> and, but I need to listen because that's how I know what's going on and that's how I can be best supportive for her. I, I really try and listen to my boys too. You know, I mean, th their reality right now, how they grow up in this world looks nothing like when I was a kid or, or even anywhere near when I was their individual ages. So listening to them and their realities and, and creating spaces in which that can happen I think is, is critically important, you know? And a lot of times it means a sense of self-sacrifice, right? I've got to put this to the side. I've got, to, I've got to be really intentional and make sure that, okay, now I realize there, there's an issue here. Someone really wants to come and talk to me and I've got to make time for that. Um, but what a blessing that is too. I mean, I, would you want it any other way? Would you want it to be a, a case in which no one felt comfortable coming to you and having a conversation. So yeah. th there's great value in that. 
I love your point. I think it's a noteworthy point. Uh, you know, when asked the question, who have you intentionally sat with to listen to, your first answer was uh, a very selfless one. It was, I try to have an open door policy to listen to whoever may want to share. And your point about how listening is, it's a gift to the other right. to let them know that they matter, to let them know that I hear you. Right. Uh, that's, a great, that's a great point. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, perspective on, uh, I guess, the give and the take of listening. Right. We receive, right. but we exactly. also gift. Um, well, so keeping in the spirit of, uh, of mission and moving forward, um, we've hit a, a several different themes on that. Uh, with radical kinship being this driving force of uh, the ultimate mission. Um, talk to me about short-term vision versus long-term vision. Yeah, um, yeah. This is something that I heard you share in one of the talks you've given. Yeah. Um, and why is that important for for radical kinship and mission? Yeah, yeah. So, so great question. You know, I, again, I think that <clears throat> there's so much that we could try to get involved in it's like uh you know how do you eat an elephant right one bite at a time you just keep chewing right because we could get overwhelmed otherwise and so i think what we need to do short term is just sort of look inward take an inventory of ourselves take stock of the communities that we're in start with the closest one to you start with your family and then go from there and ask yourself how am i really doing you know and i think in in that context we have some great guides i think you know and this, and I'm going to refer to a definition of humility that you shared with me because I, I've, I've just absolutely exploited it ever since hearing it. I love it. But you shared with me that C.S. Lewis had said that the definition of humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often. Mm -hmm. And I love that because to me, it reconciles, Lance, this tension sometimes between can I acknowledge the unique gifts and talents that God has bestowed upon me? just as he has bestowed unique gifts and talents upon you. Can mm -hmm. I recognize those and at the same time still be humble? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, right? And, and it's all about where am I directing those gifts and talents? Where, where am I putting my efforts with those towards? And if it's towards the other, if it's toward the greater good, if it's toward the common good, then I think that's exactly where we need to be aligned. Um, so, so that's starting small and, and moving bigger, you know, to bigger places. There's a great song, Dream Big, that a, uh, Dream Small, excuse me, that a colleague had suggested to me. We're told all the time, Dream Big, Dream mm -hmm. Big. And there's some, there's some validity to that. But when we dream small, I think we give ourselves a little bit of a break too and take some pressure off of ourselves, you know, because dreaming small means, how did I do today? You know, what, what was it today that made me acknowledge my neighbor? Mm -hmm. What was it today that made me allow myself to put other things aside to listen to someone else. And, and how did I do that? You know, and, and those are the small things, but gosh, they, they sure do add up and can create quite a change over the course of time. I love that, the, uh, that it can get discouraging if the dream is always only big right. or the vision is always only long. Right. Um, sometimes it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to gather momentum with small achievements to get the ball rolling, to, exactly. to motivate and re-motivate exactly. uh, along the journey. Um, and then, you know, with regard to the long game, the one image that I love, I think I had heard it in a lyric of a song, and I wouldn't be able to quote what the song is, but it, it, it made me think of an image, and the image is simply this. Have you ever seen a hearse with a luggage rack? And the answer is no. Why? Because you can't take things with you where we're going to go, hopefully, if we want to go to the place that we're trying to get to, right? So. All your assets, everything that's on paper, what you have in your closets, your home, your possessions, it's not getting put on a luggage rack of a hearse, right? But your body is going to be in there and, and you know where you're going. And so what truly are you going to leave behind? Which is going to be lasting, not just to yourself, but really at the end of the day, a reflection of who your creator is as well. Uh, I love that. Uh, it, it, it stirs up the coach in me. Yeah, uh, exactly. Just to, you know, we... I, I appreciate your your invitation to really uh, recognize the value of today and uh, to reflect back and to see what did we accomplish? Did we acknowledge the gifts that God's given us uh, with humility? Uh, I love I love the point that that's absolutely possible. Right. But uh, just that emphasis on um, seizing the day—it's our yeah. gift. Uh, it's what we have, and 
and thinking about this Lenten, se Lenten season. Um, as we approach uh, Good Friday, uh, we look at dying to ourselves and joining Christ in that, in that passion right. and then prepping our hearts for resurrection. Um, that's a great invitation just to, uh, to consider both the long-term vision, the big dream, but also to, to don't forget that zoomed in, uh, how's the day going? And, right, uh, right. Well, yeah. and you're using the analogy too of Holy Week. I mean, it, we, we all want to claim that we're Easter people and we are, but Easter is also the most exciting for me. I, I love Easter. I mean, I go to church on Easter and I'm all hyped up. I mean, it's the most <laughs> exciting day of the year for me, but we can't forget that we don't get to Easter without going through Good Friday. Right? So, I mean, the suffering exists all around. The Buddhists put this perfectly. Their very first tenet is life is suffering. And then they move on from there. So it's an acknowledgement and it's not even necessarily one in a negative context. It's just, yes, this exists. So how do we better come together as community, as individuals to help each other out with that so that we can get to a place where we experience joy and positivity and love and, and all the good things that we much rather much rather experience. I love that 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 critical piece for radical kinship. Uh, that there may be a level of suffering that's necessary, and probably for all, all of our audience, we can probably think of relationships that have become radically close. Right. That before that moment was very difficult. Yeah. We we might had to have suffered our way through maybe our own stances, maybe surrendering and compromising and forming right. a, a one heart uh, right. where we are each other's, as you pointed out so beautifully. Right. Well, Rob, man, this has been awesome. Uh, round two. It's great, great to get to know you. Great to Same here. great to introduce you to Acadiana. Uh, Lords has had a year of having the great opportunity of getting to know you, but I think it's so important uh, as Vice President of Mission of Lords, uh, who is who is the guy that's the, yeah. the new missionary uh, out there, you know, yeah. bringing this great service of love and charity and radical kinship through healthcare to uh, Acadiana. Thank you so much. Thank and you, uh, to our audience that joined us this evening, thank you all for joining us. We pray and hope that you're having a powerful Lent. We look forward to seeing you at the next one.